Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Barnes & Noble Book Club. I am Richard Russo, and today I am going to be in conversation with Jess Walter, who is, to my mind, pound for pound, the funniest writer in America. His new novel, The Cold Millions, is his most ambitious to date. Since the pandemic hit in March, and we all went into lockdown, I have read more great novels and short story collections than I have in the last three years, I think. And The Cold Millions is my personal favorite. Before we get started, um, just a couple of um, housekeeping details. Somewhere on your screen, on mine it's towards the bottom and it looks green, um, you're going to see a little button down there that says chat. Um, don't worry if you're in the room by yourself. Um, that's just what you click on if you want to ask Jess a question. And you can do that at any point in, in, in this. So don't, you don't have necessarily have to wait till the end. Whenever something occurs to you, you can just write it down on that chat. Our session is designed to go roughly 45 minutes, which will be a challenge for Jess and I. Uh, we've done these things before. Um, Jess will begin with a short reading, and then he and I will chat. And at the end of that, we will do a few of those uh, Q&As from the chat room. When things begin to go wrong, and they may, it will be my fault. I'll just tell you that right now. Barnes & Noble is foolishly depending on a degree of tech savvy that I simply do not possess. And I am depending on them to rescue me when things head south. Jess Walter is the author of eight books of fiction, including Citizen Vince, The Zero, The Financial Lives of the Poets, and the mega best-selling Beautiful Ruins. I have been on Jess's bandwagon since Citizen Vince, a novel I loved so much that I wrote a screenplay based on it. You may not remember the film because it never got made, but trust me, it would have won all the major awards and catapulted its author into major fame much sooner. But as you know, he got there eventually all on his own. And I'm delighted for the opportunity to talk to him today about his new novel. First though, let's get a taste of it. Jess, how about a short reading? Thanks so much, Rick. Uh, and thanks to everyone from Barnes and Noble. Um, uh, Thank you for championing this book. Uh, and thank you, Rick, for agreeing to do this and, and uh, yeah, for, for uh, you know, being, for telling people about my work way back in 2005. And um, I still think that movie should be made. <laughs> I would still give you the awards for it. Uh, I'm just gonna read two really short sections from the book to kind of give you a feel for it. Um, uh, the first is uh, uh, about, follows the two main characters, Ryan and Gig Dolan. Uh, Ryan and Gig are uh, 16 and 23. They are uh, orphans from Montana who are, who are caught up in the itinerant uh, work of 1909, which is when the novel is set. Um, they travel from town to town hopping rail, hopping trains, and, uh, and taking work. They get caught up in the free speech riots of the industrial workers of the world of, in 1909, uh, and a labor organizer named Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Uh, and that's really the, the structure of the novel. Um, and so I'm just going to read a little bit from their uh, ch from one of their chapters, which are told in third person. And then uh, the novel is also under um, is also cut with these sort of undercurrents of first person stories, other characters in the novel who narrate um, their way through it. So I'm going to read just a little bit of that also. But th this first is Gig and Rye Dolan, which gives you a little bit of a taste for the language of that time and of the novel. For a year, they moved, barely pausing for breath. They walked 20 miles some days and ran down freight on the slow edges of town, hopped boxcars and crouched on the blinds between mail cars. Gig showed Rye his favorite way to travel, in the open, on flat cars and lumber racks, flying, he called it, wind in his face, sun on his arms. They flew and floated this way, job to job, week to week, farm to farm, Washington to Oregon to Idaho, until they landed a Jippo logging crew on the St. Joe River, Gig talking his way onto one end of a two-man misery whip, Rye ladling water and pounding wedges in the kerfs to keep the saws from binding. But they got run from that job too, replaced by the foreman's nephews. 
They followed rumors to interior farms and staggered harvests, bushed wheat and picked huckleberries. The panic of 07 had run the banks and it was rare to find a boxcar or a barn without a vagrant in it. Most days they'd wait hours in line at the job sharks only to be told there was nothing for them. They huddled under burlap on boxcars, drank from streams and ate squirrel meat over jungle cook fires boiled up their clothes and slept beneath stars, ducked train gangs and rail bulls. And if it wasn't an easy life, Rye would be lying if he didn't admit to some adventure in it. Spokane was based for 5,000 floating workers and the brothers put on their best shirts and queued at some of the 30 employment agencies lining Stephen Street beneath bunk signs promising work for good men, $1 jobs for all, inquire within. A hard season for men but lying was having a banner year. Uh, and now I'm gonna read a little bit from one of the first person sections. Uh, the, the novel follows Rye and Gig as they navigate this world, as they get swept up in, in uh, this labor dispute and in the violence th um, that the police and Pinkerton detectives um, bring upon those workers. But it also has, um, uh, Pinkerton Detectives, a Native American worker, uh, and one of my favorite characters, Ursula the Great, who is a vaudeville singer who um, performs on stage with a live cougar. Uh, and every once in a while, as I said, these characters come in and in first person narrate their own sections, which uh, hopefully adds a sort of breadth to the 1909 world that I try to create. So this is a little bit of Ursula the Great. A woman owns nothing in this world but her memories, a shabby return on so steep an investment. The first Ursula taught me this. The other thing she taught me was how to climb in a cage and sing to a mountain lion. I was the second Ursula. I met the first in the spring of 1909. She'd been doing the act for 10 years, nearly half her vaudeville life. By the time I met her, she was putting her stage makeup on with a putty knife, dyeing her hair every morning, and every night wrestling her rangy tits into corseted captivity like two escaped criminals. Then she would walk on stage and try not to get eaten by a cougar. It was a bear, the first creature Ursula performed with, and the reason she was called Ursula, Ursa being Latin for bear, according to her fat stacked manager, Joe Considine, who hired me to replace her. This was in Reno, Nevada, where I answered a simple newspaper ad for actress, singer, calm demeanor. Anyway, so that's uh, the basic thrust of the novel. These two characters, Ryan Gig, uh, and all these wild people that they meet, these, uh, some of whom are based on real historical characters, um, some of whom uh, come out of imagination and too much time spent in libraries. So again, thank you all for coming. And I'm so excited to talk to my literary hero and the and a mentor to more than just what I should bring on book tour, um, uh, the great Richard Russo. So thank you, Rick. Well, before we dive into the novel, I, I thought I would ask um, ask you a, a general question, Jess, because um, they're living where I, I live in Portland. We have a, a fairly large writer community, and my writer friends seem to break down into two camps right now. Um, Either the pandemic has shut them down completely or it's, or it's kind of ramped them up. Um, and yeah. uh, I fall kind of into the latter camp and I'm not sure what it means, but it, but it seems like I've been waiting for a decade for someone um, to tell me to go home, stay there. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and here I am and I, and I have to admit, you know, as brutal as these months have been, um, the months that I'm here, or the, 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 the hours that I'm here working uh, have been pretty terrific. And I'm wondering where, I'm wondering how that is, how that has been for you. I think, you know, that's, that's such an interesting question. I think I've fallen into both camps at different times. Um, uh, for me, honestly, I've worked at home since, I mean, I've, I've been social distancing since 1995. Nobody, just nobody <laughs> noticed, you know, the, <laughs> The, uh, the life of the novelist is very much to work on your own. And, um, and I think because I was finishing this book and doing the editing, it, I, it, in many ways, it didn't really change things for me. So I think I've been probably just as productive over time. You know, I think it runs in those, in those stretches. I think it was harder for me to read for a while, though, yeah. which is strange for me. Um, and I think the election, the pandemic, 
um, we lived under just a constant st st uh, state of dread, I think. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a word that I'm quite fond of in the novel, um, Del Dalvo, this detective who comes on, announces himself by saying, Spokane gave me the morbs. Um, <laughs> there was yeah. this word that had gone out of style, this sense of, of sort of morbid dread surrounding you. And I feel like, you know, the, 2020 has been the morbs, you know, it's yeah. been, and so, so for a while I had trouble reading a couple of very short books, one of them, uh, intimations by, um, uh, by Zadie Smith sort of launched me back in, but for yeah. a while I had trouble reading anything but 538.com and, um, you know, and pandemic sites. Yeah, I know the feeling. I, I guess, I guess with, with, with me, I, I found that the only the only sane hours of my day have been mm -hmm. when I've been writing. The rest of it is just yeah. has just been the shit show that it's been for everybody else. But somehow or other, during those during those hours when I've been able and it and it, it's 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 such a it's such a gift when you when you when you when you feel like yourself, at least, even if it's only for a brief brief period of time. I I've been writing I've, a couple of times where I've written characters, you know, having dinner or hugging. And I thought, can they do that? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. This it's moment of just like, uh, how do I deal with the pandemic in this short story I'm writing or in this yeah. novel? You yeah. know, um, because it, it, it's, it has altered most of our realities. And so do you, re do you represent that in fiction? You know, to write about 1909 was interesting because it was sandwiched by the Russian flu and Spanish flu. And it was yeah. such, such a common, you know, part of life um, to have these pandemics sweep through at the early part of the 20th century that it didn't, it felt, it, it felt very much, it was one of those echoes in the novel that I just kept seeing. Yeah. Well, that's one of them. That's actually is a great segue to my first question, which is, um, for a book about the Wobblies, which not many people <laughs> necessarily know anymore who they were, for a book about the Wobblies, the Cold Millions does feel very contemporary. And it seems to me that in part that's due to the fact that the problems we deal with as Americans now, you know, pandemics, obviously, but income inequality, um, a lot of our problems um, seem so entrenched. And so I guess, I mean, we don't write books over a period of months, we write them over a period of years. And I assume that you were writing a, writing this book, um, you know, at, from the time Trump came down that golden escalator, you've been, you've been writing this book. Um, and so I wondered if in the writing of it, if current events um, either altered the shape of the book uh, or its course in any way, did you find yourself looking, you know, reading the day, the, the day's new, watching the news and saying, you know, this is going on. I need to, I need to deal with this in, yeah. in the cold millions. Um, not really. You know, I started it before 2016. I, I had this idea for a novel for years. I, well, I know you've been telling, you've been telling me for a long time. I'm yeah. working on this strange book about the Wobblies. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you would make the same face everyone else did when I would say I'm writing a novel about the Wobblies. <laughs> they would, um, you know, like, uh, maybe don't do that. But um, yeah, I, I, it, the one piece that, that, that definitely was political that, that I had sort of baked in from the beginning was, um, writing about income inequality, but not in a didactic way or in a political way, but in a character way. And, right. um, and so these working guys, the, um, you know, that, that very much did feel like, um, like a way to write a contemporary novel, but have it be a historical novel. And, and so definitely, you know, I, I, I have been on soapboxes about income inequality for years and, yeah. Never more so than now, when forty million Americans lose their job and billion jobs, and billionaires get richer by something like yeah. a trillion dollars, almost a trillion dollars. And so yeah. we, have, the system is clearly broken. And and so in a way, this this was like being able to take a really simple system, the job agents, these job sharks who charged these vagrant workers a dollar um, and then stole from them and fired them and split the dollar with the foremans. Um, workers who had to pay for their own, their, you know, you cut a finger off on a farm job, you have to pay for your own health care, you have to pay for your own food at these. And, uh, um, and so it was a very simple way to sort of uh, almost do like a one-celled organism that you can study the larger, 
you know, the sure. larger sense of life. So definitely that was part of it. Over the last few years, as I was working on the novel, I think the thing that that worked its way into my subconscious and into the characters was watching young people lead these incredible protests and the incredible activism of young people. Yeah. Watching the shooting survivors at Parkland, um, in Parkland, Florida, you know, fight for reasonable gun laws. Watching um, uh, students walk out of their schools for climate change. Watching the, the young activists uh, with Black Lives Matter this summer. Um, and so Rye is 16, Gig is 23, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who, even though the, Rye is the protagonist of the novel, she is sort of the hero, yeah, is, yeah. Is, is 19, a 19 year old pregnant labor activist, 10 years before she has the right to vote, standing on street corners, you know. Um, and so I think I, I very much was, you know, trying to think about that early idealism. And to me, nothing speaks more of idealism than this era of labor, this era when um, the simple idea of giving of giving work to people um, and having them get a de get decent pay for an eight hour day, a 10 hour day even is, um, you know, and so, so I definitely think I, that was working its way into my system as I was writing the novel. I did not know the summer was going to erupt, erupt in, in civil disobedience and that the riots and the, and the police brutality of the novel would feel so pointed. But, um, you know, but the last four years has been four years of protest and resistance. And so I yeah. do think it worked its way into the writing. Of, of course, of course. Um, the Cold Millions also is a book that contains a lot of other books. Yeah. Um, War and Peace, I think maybe most centrally. But I found myself actually thinking back to Bleak House and, oh, yeah. and um, um, where Dickens takes such care yeah. to link through term, in terms of plot and character, yeah. the smallest lives in yeah. the book, like yeah. Joe the Crossing Sweeper. Yeah. Um, he, he links those in, in very subtle ways in terms of plot and theme to, of course, the larger than life characters like Lady Dedlock, who lives in, who, who lives just outside of London in that, in that, in that incredible, in that incredible mansion. And reading The Cold Millions, I, I, I saw, I, Jess is doing exactly the same thing, taking, taking the smallest lives and weaving them in with um, with with the larger lives, mm -hmm. the poor with the rich, you know, the um, um, you know people with no agency, with people who have agency over others. Lem Brand is one of those is one of those men. Yeah. yeah. In a small room with other guys just like him, who are making decisions that everybody has to live with. But this is this is just this is just a, a book like Dickens, like Tolstoy with just this canvas. It's, and it's a wonderfully large canvas. And that's part of the thrill of reading it, I think. I, how much were you aware of, of, of tying those things together like that as, as you did? I mean, I, I think there's a really interesting line from Dickens. And if you think about the period of this novel, it is, you know, it's so much closer to that period than it is our own. And, yeah. um, and but I think that line goes through the Steinbeck of, of Cannery Row too. Um, yeah. and, and it goes through nobody's fool. It goes through your work as well, you know? And I think it is that, you know, I, I've always been drawn to the people we drive past and don't look at and, and, and to think that their lives contain as much grandeur as anyone else's, you know? And, um, and so, you know, the, those periods, I'm, I'm really drawn to those periods when, for instance, the depression, when, you know, when so many people are out of work, we've, we've somehow landed in a place where we blame people for their poverty. We assume it's some mistake they've made. Yeah. And there are periods of history where, in which I don't think that is necessarily the case. And yeah. Uh, and I really find myself drawn to those that I, I'm so glad you talk about that larger world because it is what I set out to try to do. And as you know, so much of writing a novel is an act of just sheer grandiosity. And, um, and it's one of those great things about being alone in that room is the bubble doesn't pop, you know, you can just yeah. keep filling, yeah. the, filling the, the balloon with grandiosity. And, um, but it, I, I, it was the reason I wrote, wrote those, those other voices was I, um, I did want to tell Ryan Giggs' story, but I wanted I wanted you to feel like you had 
um, like you had seen, you know, this, the full scene, the full street scene of all those people. And, um, uh, and I kept Jules and Jules too is such a wonderful, he's such a wonderful character and hearing things, seeing things through his eyes, hearing things through, through his voice. There are some, there are some, some of the most adventurous moments of the, of the book are, are seen through Jules's eyes and, and, and they're, and, and they're wonderful. And he is one of those people that in the larger sweep of history that you would drive past and not notice. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and again, you've got this historical moment. You have a really young city. Um, Jules is there for its birth, essentially. And yeah. he, he describes, you know, he, he is, uh, Jules is, is a Spokane Indian. He's one of the people driven from the city that it's then named for. And that, yeah. and that horrible irony undercuts his entire story. And, um, and he, the, uh, the novel is framed by something that happens in 1864 um, when he is working for a ferryman uh, and 1964 when we um, when we sort of leave the action and in those hundred years you know an entire civilization is is born and I think it's one of the things I really like writing about the West is um, is you just aren't that far removed from the violence the the environmental degradation all the things that sort of you know, spark a city. Uh, you, somewhere like Manhattan is buried under so many layers of civilization. Uh, in the West, you know, you can have someone like Jules who can remember when there was no city there. Right. And right. it was so important right. for me to include that voice um, and to include it, you know, uh, one, of, one of the, for me, the thrills of the novel was um, Jules speaks French and a little bit of Salish, uh, his right. native language. And we have a terrific school here called the Salish School that um, teaches the language, is re- reviving the language. And so, you know, going to them and having them provide a, a line of dialogue for the novel felt like a way to sort of give that character back uh, some of his voice. Well, speaking of, it's, it's Spokane is definitely a, a, um, a character in this, in this, in this novel. Um, this read to me like a love letter to your hometown. Is, is that what it feels like to you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, uh, you know how we all are with our hometowns. When someone else knocks it, we stand up for it. And when someone else says how great it is, we tell them how terrible it is. You know, <laughs> so, um, you know Del Dalvo, that detective who talks about the morbs, also describes it as a box of misery spilled out over the valley. And uh, so, but yeah, it, you know, it, it, it definitely... Uh, I, I remember as a young writer reading books set in the South and thinking, how do they imbue so much character in the place? Uh, and there's a heartbreak, there's a, there's a sorrow, um, there's a shame over slavery. There are, um, there are all these things that, that, that seem to seep up from, the, from beneath the place. Right. Um, and I had not seen my city written about that way. And, and you know, and, and it was something that I really wanted to do to, to, to kind of give the place um, its own sense of, of mystery and, and um, legacy and tragedy um, and, and to not shy away from, you know, the way the tribe was treated, the, the, the horrible way in which the river was treated, you know, with, yeah. uh, with trap doors and the bridges so you could dump garbage straight into the river so yeah. it didn't that's, bung that's up. That's one of the great details of the novel, yeah. Well, yeah. in that research, you know, finding this photo in an old newspaper of people lined up to throw their garbage through the trap door of the bridge. Um, so. I, I didn't want to shy away from that stuff, but I, but, but I wanted to, to really show when, um, you know, at the time Spokane was the most vibrant city in the West. It was rivaling San Francisco as the best show town. Um, while Seattle had more people, Spokane was considered more sophisticated, you know? And so to, to grow up in this sort of sleepy place and then be, to be able to, to go back to its heyday was a great treat for me. Yeah, yeah. One of the, to me, to me, one of the most intriguing characters in this in this book is the anarchist Early Rustin. Um, I'm I'm still trying to I'm still trying to I know what I think about him, but I'm still trying to figure out how I feel about him. <laughs> but yeah. but he's he says he says to Gig, um, the more idealistic of the two brothers, he says, "I just don't see how you fight a class war without the war." Yeah. You know, and it's and it's and it is one of the it's one of the book's fundamental questions, isn't it? Is is that how does meaningful change 
come about. And a character and a and a character like Early, I think is is fascinating because, in some ways, as horrible as he is, he's very difficult to dismiss. Yeah. And yeah. what he says is at the one is 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 at once kind of horrifying, often. Uh, but you can't knock him for a lack of candor and honesty. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 it's, and he's kind of, and he's kind of winning in an awful way. Can you talk a little bit about him? Yeah. Um, as you know, the, the, there's a, there's a certain level of ambiguity that sometimes can be really freeing as an author. Yeah. And, um, and I, I, I knew the characters so well, and I had this sense often that I was sort of carrying them around in my hands and was caring for them and, and knew their backstories and their later stories. And it was freeing to me, and I think helpful to the novel to, 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 have, to not have complete access to one of the characters, to let, yeah. to let early say the things I was afraid of someone saying, to maybe not know his entire motivation, to allow him um, uh, ele- uh, to, li- to, to exist in the shadows a little bit. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't have wanted to give him one of your point of view chapters, would you? Because no, then you no. would have, then you, yeah. That, no, that, no, that I, ruins that ruins yeah, the and it, and that and having him just a, a, just sort of in the shadows and and you know moving side to side I think also underlines those lines that he said as you yeah. said and and you know it's something that a lot of us I think have asked ourselves in America how how does change come about you know how how fast do we have should we move how um if the other side is cheating should we cheat if the other side is violent should we be violent um i mean it's it's a really fundamental question and um and it was one i think the novel grapples with and and so early and you know whoever whichever side he's on um i think you know poses that larger question of you know how long do we wait how uh, and and i think these things really are cyclical it's one of the reasons i wanted to push the end of the novel to 1964 um, because at, at that point rise life has every benefit of of the labor movement that elizabeth Gurley flynn started yeah uh, and and he is li- he's living proof um, of the improvements that are made the the growth of a of an entire middle class that didn't exist before labor. Right. Uh, and right. so it was important for me to sort of land the novel on that shore um, because there's a sort of leading edge to, um, to activists like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and they often don't get to see the results of their, of their right. work or uh, certainly not in the timeline that they want. And even, a, even you know, um, and so, so for me, uh, you know, early Reston is, is the other side of that, you know, the yeah. desire to, to blow things up and start from scratch, the, you know, the draw of, of anarchy and of, um, uh, and of violence to meet violence. Yeah. You bring up the end of the novel and I wanted to go there at some point anyway. So this is, this is a, this is a good, uh, a good place to go there. I think one of the most, for me, one of the most satisfying things, um, about the cold millions is the way that you wrap it up by going by flashing forward to 1964. There's something so incredibly satisfying about seeing what kind of man this boy that we've been following turns out to be. Yeah. There aren't very many novels that do that, that will, that will, that will give you, we often, a novel will, will end with a sense that, okay, the, character, the character's life will never be the same again, or it will always be the same. And there are various kind of conventional ways to, right. to, to end up, the, the novel ends, the novel ends when, when we're not worried about the character anymore, right. or when we start worrying even, even, even yeah, with, oh, you think to yourself, oh God, he is just so screwed. <laughs> but, but here, you, but here you, kind of, you kind of close that off. Um, and we see what a, and we see what a, decent man um, Rye has become, I don't give too much away here, but, but I, I, you know, and laugh at me if you want, but, but this, this reminded me strangely, the way you stuck the landing here uh, at the end of the book, it reminded me a little bit of, of the coda at the end of the movie, the, the, the Magnificent Seven, <laughs> where, where you'll, where you'll Brenner says in the end, it's always the farmers who win. Oh, wow. Remember, wow. remember, remember that? I'll have to go watch because that. You, you, 
you have you have this. It was it, it's been a story of operatic violence, as as um, the Cold Millions often is, and it's been a story about people who live larger than life lives. And you're right in the middle. You're right in the middle of all of this, this storm and drang, and and. And and you and you think you'd, you'd be tempted to think to yourself, well, that's what matters. Being in the being in the middle of the parade. To go to one of your one of your metaphors in this book, it's better to be in the middle of the parade, yeah. taking part in the activity, than it is to stand on the sidewalk yeah. and watch it all go by. Yeah. But this is a this is a book that this is a book that suggests that a lot of the really hard work isn't the operatic violence, and it isn't the. Um, the larger than life lives. It's those to go back to what you were talking about earlier. Those smaller lives, the lives that you're you're tempted to 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 uh, to drive past. Um, and so I guess I was going to having landed it that way. It seems to me that your 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 basic optimism that I see in so much of your work is really very much um, on display here at the end of this book. And I'm wondering if you do think that the that the arc of history bends towards justice and that lives like rise. Um, are 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 as are are as important as those gunslingers' lives. I do, I, and I think most of us live those lives. You know, the, yeah. the in um, it's interesting that that you you know it is sort of an old fashioned thing to do. And I when I realized I was writing an epilogue, and I was so taken by rise. Um, Rise reading uh, um, War and Peace, and yeah. uh, and it and there's a line from War and Peace that I that uh, is the epigraph to the epilogue. Life did not stop, and one had to live. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and I did spend the last four years thinking, you know, how do I tell my children um, that things are going to get better, that this will pass, that that you know, and and so it it very much, if if I come across as a hopeful writer it's out of hope yeah <laughs> you know it's um it's out of the desire to create that world and 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 i think that hopefully animates the things that i do and the way that i am with people and so of course it's going to bleed its way into the writing as well yeah. Um, yeah. and i think rye it's one of the things i loved came to love most about both gig and rye was the way um for them hope was was uh, contained within the pages of a book, um, and their sense of life. Rye, it's a coming of age story, and and it, Rye comes of age reading War and Peace of all things, yeah. and and yeah. and seeing those other lives that are swept up in this in the waves of history. Um, but those waves do die down, and life does go on. And um, and I think I think you know, writing that epilogue, it did feel old fashioned and subversive at the same time. You wrote, yeah. a, you wrote one of my favorite essays about writing about omniscience and how yeah. writers had gone away from omniscience. And often I think to look for something subversive is just to look what, look at what Dickens did, look at what yeah. um, Lawrence Stern did. You know, the novel yeah. was kind of invented, um, the very word novel means new. It was invented in this burst of kind of experimentation. And then we forget that yeah. these amazing things can be terrific storytelling tools. And so to write, uh, you know, a nine page epilogue or whatever it was, you know, there, there was a time I think when writers would have thought that was cheating, you know, you yeah. finished the book, you can't tell us more. Yeah. Um, but reading the epilogue of, of War and Peace was thrilling for me and it, and yeah. it was, you know, as I was modeling that, I wanted to model the form as well. Yeah. Um, I also felt um, there, there's some wonderful female characters um, in this book, uh, and I wanted to talk a little about about Ursula um, and, and and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn as well, because one is a historical character and the other is um, um, is is purely fictional. But of course, we all know that imagination comes into play in both in in in, in both realms. Um, it, but I wondered um, what it was like um, to write those two characters because with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, you had you had you had a certain set of facts that you had to stay roughly within. You could yeah. you know you could you could you could play around a little, but you couldn't invent someone wholly new. Um, 
when I was reading the Ursula, when I was reading the Ursula sections, I was I, I found myself grinning ear to ear all the way all the way through those because that was what that was when I felt like this is my friend Jess Walter doing what he does. I could I could feel you. I could I could almost feel you um, chafing a little bit at at some of the boundaries of the book that you had created for yourself, and you and every now and then you would say, "All right, I'm just going to bust out of this," you yeah. know, and 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 we're and we're going to use this 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 wonderful, bizarre yeah. Ursula who just leaps off the page and does her own thing. Yeah, it, um, it, it was hard. This is my, you know, I, I tend to, to uh, show very little respect for genre boundaries. I write kind of all <laughs> over the place. And, yeah. um, but this, but writing historical fiction creates a kind of responsibility to the real story you're telling. And I, being a former journalist, I take that pretty seriously. Yeah. And so um, most of the things Elizabeth Gurley Flynn says in the book come from speeches of hers or from newspaper articles. And, um, and, and, but I did want to I did want to create a character. She has a very specific kind of agency. She is irrepressible, bursts into yeah. these towns, you know, organizing things, standing up to the cops and, um, is almost a once in a lifetime character. And, and I wanted to show another kind of agency that a woman might have had in 1909, working within a really degraded and awful system. And so to get to create that character um, and, and then, you know, to think, you know, well, how would you dance with a wild cougar? Well, of course you would so beef liver into the corset so that, you know, so that he's got something to eat, you know, the, um, just that great invention was like, I got to take the shackles off my imagination a bit, yeah, yeah. but I ended up with, with, you know, thinking those characters balance each other really well and, or creating a character like Del Dalvo, who, you know, you don't get to write villains very often, but, you know, um, and of course, even then, once I'm inside his point of view and I see his, you know, one of my favorite moments for Del is when he, he longs to go to his daughter and his grandson who is six or nine. Yeah. And I just love the, the gap in those two ages. It tells you what sort of grandfather he's been. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere between six and nine. So yeah. it looks like we've got some questions. Yeah, I think it's uh, as much as I'd love to, I'd, as, as much as I'd love to take all of your time, we should go to the chat room right now. I suppose I can just call you and we can just chat some more. I, I, I wanna hear all the stuff you've been working on. So. <laughs> But I'll, um, yeah, let's go to some of these questions. Um, which characters were hard for you to write about? Um, uh, I think Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was really difficult. She actually took up more real estate in the book. Uh, and my editor, um, my Jennifer Barth, terrific editor, had a great suggestion that um, almost like early rest, and I think she grew in stature by um, by being diminished somewhat in the book, um, by having that sort of arm's distance. So, um, so that was difficult. I really it's it's hard to think that the hero of your book in a way isn't the person who is going to also be the protagonist and but I think that made the book better to sort of lessen her. Um, Donna Atkinson you've gone many ways with your characters what drew your interest to the birth of labor unions? Uh, I come from a labor family my dad was a steel worker for um, 35 years at Kaiser Aluminum um, high school dropout and uh, Navy veteran who worked his way into the middle class. And so that that moment at the end of the book is actually the moment right before I come onto the planet. Uh, and it was lovely for me to kind of write a character who embodied the principles my dad believed in. He, my dad was all about fairness and egalitarianism um, because of this union job. He believed you lift everybody up and he took his job really seriously. Both of my grandfathers were um, working class men. Both of them were itinerant workers during the depression. Um, my grandpa Jess hopped trains. That's where I first wanted to write about uh, about this because he made it sound so adventurous. And to me, my favorite book was, was Treasure Island. And to me, hopping a train sounded like stowing away on a pirate ship. And so, <laughs> um, so I think that's where, you know, for me, the idea of labor came from. And I do like to look at things that have sort of um, fallen by the wayside and, and aren't seen with romance anymore. I, I think the past is a great place to look for those ideas that are kind of subversive. I, I think you were a union guy in this, like um, since the, since the mid, mid or late 60s, right, Rick? 
Well, actually, yeah, I was, uh, I, I have been, um, I'm 71 now, and I have been, as a young man, a member of the Laborers Union Yeah. Uh, back in the 60s. Wow. And I'm now a member of the Screenwriters Guild. Right, and the Authors so, Guild. So, so, I mean, those, those couldn't be more different experiences <laughs> of, of, of life. I don't think there would be many people who could say, I'm a member of the Laborers, <laughs> the laborers Union and the Screenwriters Guild, but, but right. you know, they well, both I, pay dues. Yeah, right. Yeah. The um, I don't think the uh, laborers union is in a is in a battle with uh, the talent agencies um, like the like the screenwriters. Guild. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. We have a question uh, from Elf Elgin. Hearing you mention that you had the idea of this novel for years, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about uh, your work process. Do you work on multiple novels in parallel and then decide to focus on one once you get a certain point um, or do you uh, yes, that is actually how it works, and I, um, I and I think you're more directed toward one thing, if I'm not mistaken, Rick. Um, Typically, yeah. Yeah, I I write until I get stuck often, and then I switch over to something else. So I had I'd been I had been keeping notes and collecting things for this novel. I'm a, I can be like a magpie, sort of flying around looking for little bits that I want to work on and I'll open a file and stick them in there. Um, and I had my wobbly file for years um, uh, with just various ideas. How am I going to get into this? Notes about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And, um, and I was working on another novel that was more contemporary. Uh, it was nice of you to, to talk about my sense of humor because um, this book was funnier, edgier, more contemporary. And I just frankly got stuck on it. And so I switched back to the last novel that had my attention and it was this one. It was, yeah. um, it was The Cold Millions. Uh, at the time it was called Nothing West of Dead. And I saw it as much more of a Western and I, mm -hmm. um, and so when I returned to Nothing West of Dead, um, it was, you know, with all the, with all of my full attention and it, you know, kind of carried its way through, but it really became a different novel in that time. I, I've grown to really like coming back to something and seeing it in a new way. I think I think I was able to see that that this was a class novel and not a Western. When I came back to it, I jettisoned a whole bunch of ideas that frankly didn't make sense. And I think I, I started trusting that idea, that, that longer view of writing with beautiful ruins, because it just took me so long to get my arms around that, that full novel, uh, that now it feels like the, the right way for me to work, to have two or three things going and then to fall into them. Aren't short, stories, aren't short stories wonderful because oh. you may not know everything, you may not know everything about them, right. but you kind of can imagine them whole, you know, yes. you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have that three, four years in which you're trying to get your arms around, around something. The short story, it's just, I don't write that many of them because I, I just, I just don't, I don't know. But, but when I do get one, it's just, it's just the greatest gift from the gods. You write, you write amazing short stories. This is <laughs> It's terrific. Uh, and The Horse Child is one of my favorite stories and collections. So well, thank you, I'm, I'm doing a story collection next and I keep going back to story collections that I love. And um, I totally agree. I love what Tobias Wolf says that the great thing with a short, short story is that you can approach perfection. Yeah. Um, yeah. No novelist has ever even approached it. They're all just big shaggy dogs that we yeah. hope someone will take home. And, yeah. you know, the, the and, it, it's funny whenever someone starts a question, um, uh, starts a question with, was it difficult? I just say yes, before yes. they finish. <laughs> so, was it difficult writing? Yes. Was it difficult? Um, you know, my seventh novel, you've written eight novels, is that right? Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> I believe it's eight. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, but, it, but the funny thing is each is different in its own unique way. Each is yeah. different in a way you couldn't have guessed. Um, and and there will always, I, for me, there has always been a moment when I've just said, I don't have this. It's beyond my abilities. It's too rangy, you know. Yeah. Um, the, you told me once that, that you get one novel that sort of comes to you whole um, and, and the rest you just have to battle. Yeah. And that's been my complete experience. I had one novel that just sort of arrived. I wrote it in about a year. The rest I've had to wrestle to the ground like a wild cougar in a cage. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's been my experience, certainly. 
Yeah. Do we have time uh, maybe for one more there? Yeah, one more. The next, um, what's next, Jess and Rick? Um, so do you want to go first with what's next? Um, I am working on a, um, a third fool novel. Um, I've, yeah, I've written uh, two novels with the word fool in it by, and that's not by chance. <laughs> and, none, and none of them autobiographical. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, have, I have so much to draw on here. Um, so there's nobody's fool and everybody's fool. And I'm working on a novel right now that I'm, right now I'm calling it just fools, but, I, but it, may have a, it may have a different, it may have a title. It may have a, uh, a title without the word fool in it. But it but it brings back some of those characters from the from the first two, yeah. um, and I've been working on some essays. So that's what's up for me. How about yourself? Um, I have a book of short stories that's coming next yeah. that um, I think will be called Mr. Voice, which is one of the uh, the story I had in Best American Short Stories a few years ago, and yeah. so I think that'll sort of anchor the. Um, and then uh, I'm working. I'm back on that novel that I abandoned before the um, the. The funny contemporary one. I I um and I I hear Spoonerisms all the time. Um, uh -huh. Reverse the first words, and uh, I'm in a, a men's Shakespeare club where we get together and talk about the plays. And we had just read uh, The Merchant of Venice, which I heard as the Virgin of Menace, which <laughs> was the best noir title ever. <laughs> uh, it doesn't fit the novel at all at this yeah. point. Written across the top of it is the Virgin of Menace. So, <laughs> but thank you so much, Rick. Thank you for uh, for this and for your work. Well, you too, you too, my friend. Yeah, um, we'll, see, we'll see each other on the other side of this. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Your lips to God's ear. Yeah. Well, I should I should wrap things up here because we have come to the end of our uh, roughly forty five minutes worth of time. Thank you, Jess, for being so generous with yours. Um, Thanks to Barnes & Noble for sponsoring this event. Um, and they would like me to remind you that the cold millions can be purchased at your local Barnes & Noble, also at um, uh, bnn.com 24 seven. Um, thanks to all of you in the audience here today for, uh, for logging on, we really appreciate. We know you're out there, we can't see you, but we sense you, we know that you're out there. Uh, and it was good of you to join us for what for me has been just a joyous occasion. Um, and I hope it has been for you too. Um, keep in mind the pandemic will be over one day and that's when the real work begins. Stay well, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>